Well, good afternoon, or depending on where you're joining us from, good morning or good evening. Uh, my name is Sarah Birch. I use she, her pronouns, and I am an associate director of admissions and recruitment for the Brown School at Washington University in St. Louis. Thank you all so much for joining us for our very first virtual info session of 2023. Um, I am really excited to be joined by a fantastic panel of faculty members today. And before um, I turn it over to them to introduce themselves, I do have just a few housekeeping things to go through. Um, so today's webinar is, um, it's a webinar version, and so we can't see or hear you, um, but we would love to invite you to introduce yourselves in the chat. Um, we also have the Q&A feature and invite you to submit questions throughout the session uh, that we can certainly make time for at the end to answer. Uh, the other thing to note is that closed captioning is available uh, on this session and it is being recorded. And so if you need to leave at any point and would like to come back and watch later, we'll be posting it on our website and on YouTube uh, for later viewing. So without further ado, I will go ahead and introduce today's session topic and then introduce our panelists. Today, uh, we are discussing the breadth of work that happens at the Brown School uh, in social work and social policy. And so from clinical work, working uh, you know, in a counseling setting, all the way to big systems level policy work, uh, our faculty, our staff, and our students are involved in a number of different things uh, that really work to impact change. Um, and positive change uh, is what we're all about at the Brown School. And so um, we're gonna discuss kind of what that means to us and put some context. Uh, here's today's agenda, I'll do introductions first and I'll ask each of my panelists to introduce themselves. And then I will briefly discuss what the levels of impact are so that we have some shared language um, around what we're kind of talking about today. I do have a few slides with career examples. So if you're wondering, you know, where do we you see yourself um, in these different levels of impact? Uh, there are a number of things that you can do and I'll have uh, slides to should go over that. And then we'll turn to a Q and A session, which will be the bulk of the session today where I'll ask our panelists to really reflect on how their work is centered in these different levels of impact. Um, and, and we'll go from there. So again, please feel free to use the Q&A um, to submit your questions, use the chat, and we will get started. So I will uh, ask each of our panelists today to introduce themselves, uh, and we will go in order of folks who, uh, as you appear on the screen. So we'll start with Manessa. Hello, everybody. My name is Manasseh Begay. I am a licensed clinical social worker and a licensed alcohol and drug abuse counselor. And I am a lecturer here with Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, or good evening, everyone. My name is Dr. Hussein Latif. I'm an assistant professor here at the Brown School. Um, I have two tracks of research. One focuses on culturally centered um, uh, prevention research for uh, African descent adolescents and youth. Uh, and the second track of my research is focused on uh, uh, re-entry and rehabilitation of justice or formerly justice involved uh, adolescent serious offenders. Hello and welcome everyone. Um, I'm the first of the two Mollies. I'm Molly Metzger, she, her pronouns. I'm a senior lecturer at the Brown School and the chair of our domestic, social, and economic development concentration within the MSW program. My work focuses on affordable housing, equitable economic development, community organizing, uh, and sort of macro issues like that. Thanks for being here. And I am the second Molly here today. My name is Molly Pearson. Um, any pronoun is okay with me. And I'm a lecturer here at the Brown School. I teach mostly in the sexual health and education specialization um, and also some foundation courses. And my work centers on gender, sexuality, sexual health, um, and harm reduction. 
Awesome. Well, thank you all so much again for being here today. Uh, you all represent a really wide array of experience and background. Uh, and so I'm really excited to dive into the session and these questions with you all. Uh, but before we do that, um, I am going to kind of set us up for kind of the context that we're, we're discussing today, which is all of these different levels of impact um, within the field of social work and then social policy. Um, and so this visual I, I saw very early in my time at the Brown School and admittedly, you know, didn't know a lot about these fields. Um, I think for those who are unfamiliar with social work, um, they have like I did, uh, and maybe a more narrow scope of what social workers do. A lot of it, of us think about it as working with, you know, children and families, maybe working in schools, um, but it goes so much further beyond. Um, and maybe you're thinking like, there are so many things I want to do. How can I make an impact? Um, and where is my place in, in these different levels of impact? And so um, certainly social workers um, and even folks involved in policy work at the micro level. Um, and so working one on one with individuals, maybe that is in a counseling setting um, or, or perhaps you're someone who is that kind of bridge in between the micro and then the next level, the mezzo. Um, so connecting individuals to resources um, within organizations or maybe you do work within an organizational or even small group setting, um, working with multiple individuals to impact change um, for, for certain populations or for specific organizations doing work within a local, um, a local context. Um, and then of course there's the macro level. So um, work that's happening at large and affecting larger populations or big systems. So thinking about policy, um, maybe it's at the organizational level because we know that policy certainly is applied in organizations and allows us to do the work that we uh, need to do. But then there's also policy at a legislative level um, where it gets codified into law and either allows or sometimes unfortunately prevents folks from living happy, healthy lives. And so that's really what a lot of the work is about that we're doing at the Brown School. Um, so slightly different visual, but uh, individual, smaller groups, organizations, big systems, and like I said, all of these in, all of these levels talk to each other. Um, and so something else that I think I hear students talk about a lot is I want to do this work at the micro level, but I want to understand policy, or I know that policy is going to impact impact individuals, and and so how can I understand how all of those things work together? And that is what the curriculum is designed at the Brown School to do is to help you think about how these things kind of speak to each other and how the work that you'll be doing um, will inevitably impact what's happening in, in other levels. And so then uh, here are some examples of the types of careers that you might find yourself in, depending on the level of impact that you work in. Uh, at the micro level, so working with the individual in their environment, you could go into clinical or direct practice. Um, certainly school social workers work at the individual level. Uh, it could be in crisis intervention, case management, um, but a lot of different settings where you find yourself working with individuals. Next at the mezzo level, working in either small or mid-sized groups. Um, or in an organizational level, you might be uh, a manager or work in educational leadership and administration. Um, you might find yourself in social entrepreneurship and, and working to create you know, new organizations that help uh, folks thrive. And then finally, the macro level. So thinking of large scale system reform um, and folks who work at this level, maybe policy analysts, lobbyists, um, you may be going into research or working in a government agency or at the local or even at the national level. Um, and so we find our students and our faculty doing all of these different things um, in the work that they do. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. And thank you all so much for introducing yourselves. I know the chat wasn't working at first, and now I'm seeing so many wonderful introductions from folks who are truly from around the world. 
So that's so incredible. We have Uganda, Taiwan, South Korea, uh, some folks who are right here in St. Louis. So nice to see you all. Bangladesh, very cool. Thank you so, so, so much for joining us. All right. And so, yeah, now I'm going to go to the fun part of the session and start <laughs> asking our, our panelists questions. Um, and I'm going to start just simply with if you could each describe the type of work that you do uh, and how that work applies to one or more of these levels of impact. And we'll go in order that you introduced yourself. So we'll start with Manasa. When I got into the field of social work, I never um, intended on getting into academia or teaching in any way, shape or form. I had done it for a number of years, but uh, my goal was always to uh, become a clinician and do mental health counseling with individuals. Uh, with kind of a ultimate goal of uh, just having my own small business of uh, providing mental health counseling. Um, and uh, as, as I guess my career changed and over time, it, it did move a little bit further into uh, the teaching world, but I still do maintain uh, private patient clients. Uh, I do work with substance abuse and a lot of trauma. I don't work with many children, uh, but I do continue to main, maintain a number of clients on a mental health basis. Uh, and since uh, things have moved a lot more towards Zoom in the world, I, I, most of my patients anymore are uh, through, through Zoom land, but uh, I still do see some individuals in person on, on an occasion. Uh, and I've been doing that for a while. I really enjoy that work. I found, find it very fulfilling um, to really be able to see change in a single individual over the periods of time that you can kind of help guide them through really their change in their life. And we're just kind of a, a tool to put things back into place where they probably should have been to begin with. Um, and I really enjoy that work. And uh, and that's on that uh, that micro level, whether it's an individual, and I, I consider families as well on a micro level. So, like uh, uh, the family unit is also included in that different micro level. Uh, but that's that that's the majority of the work I really do on the micro level currently. I, I do some other stuff on the macro level. Maybe we'll talk about that in a few. Um, but that's my micro level work. Wonderful. That's amazing. Um, so for myself, uh, I will say uh, I started my career journey, um, even going back to when I was an undergrad with an interest in meso level practice um, and thinking about community level implications for the healthy development of children of color uh, coming of age in low resource uh, constrained environment. So that was always like a motivating factor for me to pursue higher education. Um, and I would say, you know, by the time I started my MSW training, uh, you know, getting more exposure to the intersection between, um, you know, as we're talking about today, you know, policy level implications, community level implications, and how those intersect with the individual, you know, I started to really, uh, you know, think in terms of like the intersection between these levels of practice. Um, and it was related to my actual, my social work post MSW training, uh, working in Arizona um, with the Board of Executive Clemency, making uh, suggestions for reentry, um, that I started to see the role and how policies can support and also hinder the process of person's development. Um, and so really, you know, taking those experiences for me today uh, as a social work researcher, um, my, my research is always a blend between thinking about number one, how does my research inform policy implications for organizations, communities, families, and also what might be the implications for larger policies if we're truly serious about positive development of marginalized children. And um, as I mentioned, my work really is focused on the, the macro level, maybe to some extent the meso level. Um, and one of the big issues that I focus on is sort of a interconnected set of housing crises in the United States. 
So we have a shortage of affordable housing. We have, you know, a homeless crisis that includes people from, you know, including individuals, sort of what many people think of as what homelessness looks like, like street homelessness. But we also have, um, including here in St. Louis, a crisis in families where kids are unstably housed. Maybe they're bouncing around, changing schools multiple times a year and just don't have a stable home um, and community to live in. And connected to that is extreme residential segregation. So because of a history of racist public policies and also private decisions made by people like white people um, deciding where to live and real estate agents um, sort of sending people to one kind of neighborhood or another based on race, we have these uh, patterns of segregation and especially, you know, here St. Louis is a, is a perfect example. So the solutions to that, to that look very different depending on what sort of neighborhood you're working in. So often people will think of the poor neighborhoods as being like, that's where like the problem resides. You know, it's really clear if you're living in a neighborhood um, where everybody is poor, um, you know, school quality is going to be lower because you have a lower tax base and things like that. Um, so some of my work with my students has been bridging into uh, either, you know, lower income neighborhoods or neighborhoods that might be gentrifying. So maybe they start out poor, but now there's sort of an influx of middle and upper class people who are sort of taking over that neighborhood and pushing people out. Um, but also recently I've been working more with those more concentrated affluent neighborhoods. So in St. Louis here, that would look like, you know, sort of the Western part of our region, West St. Louis County, where there is a concentration of affluence. And what does the policy agenda look like that um, to sort of open up those communities to a wider range of people to create affordable rental housing, but also affordable home ownership opportunities. So I really tried to connect my students to community uh, groups who are sort of working on the ground to both see uh, that, you know, have been creating segregation for so many years um, and also working with community organizations to start, you know, doing the work of building the housing, building the community organizations that can, can fight for change. Um, I think uh, I've had an evolution in how I think of my own level of practice, whether it's micro, meso, or macro. I knew coming into the Brown School, because um, I, I teach at the Brown School, but I'm also an alum. Um, and so when I came into the Brown School as a student, I knew that I wanted to do meso and macro level practice. That, that was an intention that I had. And one thing that I have learned um, and I now tell my students all the time is that these levels are helpful to help us think through our work, but in practice, the lines actually get really blurry. Um, and I think that's really important to understand um, sooner rather than later. Um, just for sake of example, so the work that I do um, centers around gender, sexuality, and sexual health. And so um, I spent a few years working in HIV policy specifically. So that meant I'm analyzing the policies um, that are similar in other states and trying to anticipate what's gonna happen here in Missouri. I'm also working with organizations, trying to organize them and rally them around a shared common goal. And I'm holding the hand of someone living with HIV, having a panic attack getting ready to walk into a hearing and testify in front of a group of people that are not friendly to them. All three of those things happen in the same day. Um, and so that's just one concrete example that I, that I like to think through and offer because I think it's easy to intellectually understand that all three levels impact each other. But I think it's really important to know too that in our actual practice, the lines can be blurry. And so having skills um, from all three areas are really, really important and come up all the time, all the time. Great, thank you all. And, and thank you, Molly, because that actually dovetails really nicely into one of the other questions that I have, which I'll ask next. And it is like, how do you cultivate a, a synergy between um, these approaches and, and, you know, what does that look like in real time? And so you gave some, a really great example of that in the work that you do. Um, I'm curious, you know, uh, Hussein, Molly Metzger, Manasseh, if you have other examples of how a synergy happens with, 
with these kind of levels of work. So I wanted to mention a, a lot large portion of my uh, population I've worked with in the past have been uh, individuals involved with the criminal justice system. Uh, as well as um, just part of my earlier career in life, I also did work as a law enforcement officer. And I've seen kind of how there's been this uh, various engagement that goes on between the law enforcement and people uh, who are in need of support services. And so one thing that I've uh, been involved with and been engaged with for the past couple of years is I do um, reach out to a number of law enforcement agencies to uh, provide training for them for trauma-informed interviewing skills and um, just some, I, I would say some coping mechanisms for officers to use while they're also working on the field. And I think um, being able to engage on in, in that area really impacts the individuals that uh, I may see on a professional level, as well as um, starting to create change in the community as a whole. And um, kind of blends in a bit of that micro meso and even into the macro level through um, just those various levels of engagement. I'm happy to speak to this one a little bit too. I think um, I really appreciated both both of the previous comments. It's very much all connected and I guess I'll just give um, sort of one example of how I how I approach this kind of um, interaction between micro meso and macro. So um, I agree with Molly. It's like there will be no macro transformation if there is not micro, you know, individual level transformation and a critical mass of people understanding how their problems that might be showing up in their lives, their families' lives, are not just theirs, but are part of broader structural forces. So, um, one way that I help my realize this, I have a personal narrative assignment in one of the policy classes that I teach that asks students to think about a place that they've lived. Often this might be a place where they uh, you know, grew up or they could write about the place they're living now in St. Louis. Think about one policy that has played a role um, in shaping that place kind of for better or for worse. And then how that in turn affected them in some small way or maybe in some really uh, profound way. And so so I'm just trying to help my, my students understand that these problems that like we're all swimming in the water of these sort of structural problems. And again, for me, often that looks like analyzing um, patterns of racism, but you could think about how that could play out in terms of all different kinds of oppression. Um, so yeah, it's not, it's not somebody else's problem. It's not, you know, this is something that we're all part of. And I think to the extent that people can realize that it makes them um, more powerful advocates because they're now advocating on their own behalf, not on behalf of, you know, somebody else. Yeah. And I, I would also add, you know, just kind of based off the previous comment that you made, Molly, that, you know, for students in particular um, aspiring to be social workers, being able to see the interconnection between these levels of practice is, to me, uh, one of the metrics of having a well-rounded education to become a social worker. Because, you know, as I think as we're starting to talk about, it's like, you know, these things don't happen in a vacuum, or, you know, whether you're, and I see sometimes students say, I want to be a clinician. Well, you know, if understanding how community level factors are these, you know, those, those community level structural factors influence your clinical practice is important. But also to understand the limitations and the, uh, and the barriers you may be having to the type of services resources to support your clients is also connected to having a very good understanding of maybe, uh, you know, neighborhood, state, and also federal, and in some cases, international policies and how those intersect on the service delivery process. And so I think, you know, I will say, I think it is a strength of our school, you know, at the Brown School, um, that I do think students are at least given an opportunity to build that pretty early on, irrespective of where they decide to um, uh, concentrate um, pretty early on at the Brown School, which is, you know, it's, it's definitely a part of the accreditation standards across schools, but, you know, there's a lot of heterogeneity in terms of how well that is done. 
Uh, and I do think we, you know, we are positioned, you know, to be, we are one of the leading, I would say, programs in doing a, a better job than a lot of schools in that for students. Thank you. And that speaks to the next question that I'm going to ask too. So y'all are doing so great. Um, and it is, you know, if others can share how, like from your perspective, how the work that's being done at the Brown School is uniquely, you know, making a an impact at these different levels or, or also helping bridge, you know, some of those things, because I think oftentimes, you know, things that we see in society are like these things happening in silos. And then that's where like real uh, challenges come to, into play. And so how, how do, how's the Brown School doing these things to kind of help enforce that synergy? Um, yeah, just love he to hear others' perspectives. I'd be happy to speak a little bit about our relationships with um, the St. Louis region. I mean, I think within the social and economic development side of the MSW program, I think one of our strengths is that we have faculty who have really strong relationships with specific communities in St. Louis. So whether that's Professor Jack Kirkland, um, and Darrell Smith now working especially on the east side of St. Louis, which is actually in the state of Illinois. Um, Jessica Payne teaches an, an economic development course and she lives um, on the near north side of the city of St. Louis, is really um, engaged in her community. And, uh, you know, these faculty members are able, it's not like we're talking about something that is abstract or that is um, like theoretical. I mean, there's theory behind our solutions. But um, these are problems that are playing out on the ground in like messy political spaces every day. So I think, you know, that sort of groundedness, you know, again, that often will show up in coursework or in practicum in terms of like really real time um, problem solving with the community members who are closest to the problem. So I think that's, that's really one of our strengths. One thing I wanted to kind of tie in with, um what was said before is from my MSW program, looking at the Brown Schools program, there's definitely a, a greater variety of varying levels of engagement. Um, my program was very clinically based and uh, individually based. And through the program here, it allows both that clinical side, uh, but to really engage the different parts of the macro and meso levels. I, I would say all at the same time in a number of different ways. Um, as I was kind of talking earlier about some of that training I do with the local law enforcement and, and I utilize students uh, from some of my coursework to help prepare and um, collect that training. And that becomes a part of their skills and uh, their CVs further down the road to be able to use that uh, in their growth. Uh, and I'm continuing to work on projects with other students uh, to provide more training for some of our partnered sites out there that we have not necessarily just here locally in the St. Louis area, but uh, being in a Native American individual uh, to some of our sites that do help serve uh, Native American communities throughout this country. So uh, really trying to bring home to my home and to some of my homelands, uh, some of these uh, education trainings and just some of the stories that the students have been able to create of their own and bring them back into the communities to help uh, share them and to help uh, grow better social workers just across the across the world. Yeah, I think uh, kind of building off of what Manasseh is saying, I think the variety of concentrations and specializations we have here at the Brown School means that inevitably you are in classes with people who have interests that overlap with yours but still diverge and so that exposes you to other perspectives that maybe you wouldn't have considered otherwise um, you can take a, a policy analysis and evaluation class and have that class with people who are planning on being clinicians, people who want to be policy analysts, and everything in between. Um, and I think that's a really unique experience. And um, I think peers can help push each other to expand our worldview and help consider, um, help us to consider 
perspectives that we wouldn't have thought about otherwise if we were all siloed in our own specific tracks. Um, and so I think it's really great when you're in a class where you do have all kinds of people studying different things, but still around a shared goal of, of the class and, and what you're learning in that class. Um, and the fact that we do have um, both social work and social policy programs here, I think is really um, also really interesting that we we have something for everybody and there's even um, possibility to individualize. So yeah, so many options to get what you need to really explore all three levels. Yeah. And I would say just to build a little bit about the classroom experience or even just the educational experience here at the Brown School as a MSW student, one one factor that I think is, a, is particularly uh, nice and a strength of the program is that assignments are really geared towards skill building. You know, sometimes you can enroll in graduate programs where it's very clear the goal is just to kind of push students through, you know, you get your grade and keep moving, you know. But I think one of the things about all of the, the faculty uh, that you have are really invested and making sure that students leave with uh, a diverse toolkit to be able to convey practice and be prepared to advance their particular area of social work. So uh, in my own classes and, and classes of others, it's very common for students to leave the Brown School having completed um, you know, a, a policy analysis, right? Um, a publication on a particular area of interest. Um, students, often write op-eds for very reputable uh, newspaper outlets. Just there's so many different ways. I've even seen students where, and I think what's nice about the Brown School, as was mentioned, the individual capacity to kind of um, fit your own goals as you continue to matriculate. Sometimes students find that, you know, they need a little bit more training in, in legal studies. And so some students are able to take classes across university in the law school or they decide to do an MSW JD. It's like, there's, there's just a lot of opportunity to get what you need um, and to really advance where you wanna go. Um, and so, yeah, that's just something I wanted to add to what was said. Great, thank you. And so speaking of courses and coursework, I know a couple of you have already mentioned some of the classes that you teach. Um, and so I'd love for you to kind of expand upon that. Do you have a favorite course that you have taught in the past um, or when, why is that your favorite course? Uh, and also kind of talk about, you know, what things are you doing in that class um, that's addressing the synergy? Um, maybe it's an example of an assignment um, or just the conversations that you have. Start with uh, Molly Pearson, if you want to start us off. Oh, of course you would ask me first. I am, um, I'm torn between two. Um, so my first answer, maybe because it's at the top of my brain, because um, I teach it at one o'clock, um, is a brand new class that I have spent a year creating um, called Harm Reduction Community Practice. So I think this is a, a good example of kind of that interplay between the micro, meso, and macro. Um, our reckoning with the war on drugs in this country in particular um, has come to a head. And so um, the conversation around reducing incarceration um, and even prison abolition is now a, a household conversation. And so we need to be prepared as social workers to engage with what that means. And so harm reduction um, and different ways of implementing harm reduction is being adopted in real time in our policy priorities at the federal, state, and local levels. And so now is the time to engage with that, grapple with that, um, and really explore what that means um, and find our own, our own way forward in that work. And so if policies are changing as we speak, that means practice is also going to be changing. Um, and so I think that's just um, an example that I can think of off the top of my head, given the context of our conversation that I, I think um, makes me really excited because it means that we're, we're working 
around something and and a part of something that is real. Like one of one of the assignments in the class is to actually analyze, bring in a current event and analyze it and talk about it in context because it's changing every single day. Um, and so that's that's an exciting thing to be able to share that space with peers and really grapple with what that means. I can give an example from one of my classes too. So um, within the MSW program, typically, unless you know you have a BSW, you have your concentration, your foundation courses in the first year, and then you move into your concentration of a course. And um, within the concentration, there are theory, policy, and practice methods courses. So one of my favorite courses that I teach is the policy class for our domestic, social, and economic development concentration. And um, I spent a lot of time before the semester starts working with um, organizations that I've worked with um, throughout the years in St. Louis to try to find, you know, are there projects that those organizations could use some help with that makes sense to be um, sort of appropriate? over the course of a semester we're not trying to like build something that we can't sustain we're trying to help organizations that have relationships that have momentum sort of continue that momentum so um, last semester our partners were two groups um, in st louis county called uh, the alliance for interracial dignity and women's voices raised for social justice who are trying to build more inclusive housing development in their in their part of the region and so that partnership culminated in a convening with a lot of elected officials. We had mayors, state representatives, um, city managers, and city staffers that all came together to talk about four really specific solutions for affordable housing. And um, we tried to find solutions that were like visionary, that would really make a difference, but that were also feasible. So, you know, it's like not, we don't want to have our heads in the clouds. Like we want to really be talking about things that, that might be doable. Um, and so it was very, very exciting to see those folks get in the room and, and for the students to have an audience for their work that are, you know, decision makers that could really make things, these things happen. And I think, you know, like Molly was saying, like some of the stuff is happening in real time. I, I don't want to over celebrate it. We still have a lot of work to do, but, you know, um, Webster Groves, Missouri, for instance, is starting to set up a, what's called a community land trust, where a community organization would take control of land to make it a permanently um, affordable sort of housing solution. So, so some of these things are really are really happening. Yeah, to to quote uh, Anna Shabson, I heard her say this in a space once, but and this is not a drill. Uh, these things are really happening, and our students are you're getting involved in this work um, in real time. So just wanted to share that. Yeah, uh, and for myself. Um, uh, right now, I primarily teach uh, in the foundation curriculum, and I actually teach sections of the social policy, social welfare services uh, class that all MSW students uh, typically will take unless you've already had extensive amount of policy to be able to test out. But I really enjoy teaching that class because uh, it's in that class, we have a lot of discussion about what we're having here. It's trying to really give students um, you know, a fundamental understanding of how, you know, regardless of where they are in terms of where their practice will be, the synergy between these different areas. And in fact, if we you look closely at social work history and how the field developed as a profession, you know, the, these relationships were always kind of embedded, you know, and there was only really this break in separating out the connection between interpersonal practice and policy, you know, at a very later time, you know, so being able to have that discussion with students to engage in that uh, foundation level setting as they continue uh, in their studies is really rewarding. And for some students, you can really see like almost like this aha moment to see, oh, wow, you know, and so I really enjoy that. Uh, and I also uh, have taught uh, a course related to uh, criminal justice practice or forensic social work practice with adult offenders and I, I enjoy teaching that. And I'm right now, I'm in the slow process, very slow process of developing a, an elective course on black liberation theory and looking at how that has uh, changed across decades 
and what are the implications for that in terms of social work uh, being allies in the process of social justice with Black communities? I think I took over the uh, course that uh, Dr. Hussein was teaching before, the criminal justice involved adults, practice and policy interventions. Um, and it kind of tied into what Molly was talking about earlier too. And just that uh, the course is really good at um, kind of taking a look at uh, these varying populations and, and really some of the experiences that um, go on there and trying to figure out what areas that we can really make some change and help support that population in a in a positive way whether it's through policy or just through uh, direct practice engagement or maybe a little bit of both and i think um, that class can be very beneficial especially for a lot of people going into like a clinical world into really just having just a better understanding and for the those that are on policy um, looking at the places where people really need a lot of support and where there's definitely some obvious places that change can happen. It's just a matter of uh, getting getting that change going and really getting it started and kind of making some of those footholds in different areas because they're, they're going on in areas and parts of the country, but it's really uh, a slow process and really just trying to get, speed some of these processes up in a way that would be very beneficial and just getting more uh, students in this field to be able to kind of push that would be it's just going to be very beneficial in the long term for a lot of the people that we all work with so great thank you all so much um now uh, i am going to turn to some questions that have been submitted by our attendees and the first uh, is, how does the Brown School foster an inclusive and equitable environment to allow students to discover their interests and grow as professionals? And I'll ask maybe just one or two of you to answer this question. Um, I can speak a little bit to that. Um, so I um, I personally, as a as an instructor, um, remind myself every day that I am a white person teaching at a predominantly white institution. And so that means I have to bring in voices and perspectives outside of myself. Um, and that includes the students. Um, I um, am deeply, deeply influenced by the pedagogy of bell hooks um, and um, teaching to transgress, a text that she wrote um, that I, I reread about once a year and um, really honoring the student's expertise and recognizing, I mean, we were talking about it, this is real, this is not a drill. And just because we are in an academic setting doesn't mean that these issues don't impact, impact us as humans. Um, and so I try to build in opportunities for students to um, engage in choice around their assignments in what topics they choose to pursue also, um, the kind of content that we have in class too. Um, I invite students to bring in things that they're interested in that they wanna talk about. Um, and I also think it's essential to think critically about our syllabus and making sure that we are building an intersectional and critical consciousness into it. Um, the word intersectionality is tossed around all the time. Um, but if we if we are taking it seriously and we're thinking critically about what it really means, that means if I'm going to have a whole day where we're talking about poverty, just for example, um, that means that there are many different experiences of poverty based on all kinds of identities and experiences and the oppressive forces that inform that experience. And so I can't just talk about poverty. I need to talk about what that looks like in different parts of the country, across identities, across populations, across communities. Um, and so I think that that's something that is so, so important. And um, I think that there are many professors who um, take a similar approach that it can't just be in a vacuum. Um, our, our syllabi have to be um, created really intentionally. And I think that that's a strength that we have at the Brown School. 
I'll say one thing that I do outside of the classroom is provide opportunities for peer to peer to support as well. Um, and sometimes that might, you know, and this isn't something that I work on per se, but you know, there might be student groups around uh, particular communities. But for me, it kind of happens within our concentration. Sometimes I feel like students, um, they really know what it's like to navigate the different classes, the different practicum opportunities, the city of St. Leo, living opportunities, just anything like that, um, maybe better than faculty too. So I try to create opportunities for them just to come together informally. Often we'll do it before it's time to register for classes. Um, but I might, you know, sort of welcome them, maybe feed them, not every time. Sometimes I provide food, sometimes not. Sometimes it's over Zoom. But, you know, I'll sort of give some information as the chair for my concentration, and then I'll leave. And I'll say, you know, have the conversation um, that you need to have. And maybe that's can be more, you know, more sort of candid or honest if there's not a faculty member in the room. So I think sometimes I'm um, just providing a, sort of a loose structure for students to support one another can be can be helpful, I think. Thank you, Molly and Molly. Um, and that actually answered uh, kind of nicely another question that we received, which, you know, just understanding that MSW programs are often very emotionally rigorous. Um, and so knowing that faculty kind of support an environment and the student experience that allows space for that and processing for that um, and just acknowledging that this is, you know, this is hard work. This is emotionally taxing work. Um, and so that I think that you spoke to that really well. Um, next question I'll ask is um, from someone who, um, has been practicing as a social worker for uh, several years and is currently actually in private practice. So what are some common challenges faced by students who are maybe re-entering uh, an academic space and how does the Brown School support that? So kind of going off of maybe a little bit what we were talking about before, but then just for folks who are coming from a professional background and going back into academia, You know, I would say um, one area that comes up quite a bit every semester, and I usually talk to my students about, is navigating the, the reading commitments or the assignment commitments of graduate school. So, I, you know, one thing we are saying is the Brown School is a fantastic program. It's a, it's a top program, but also it's a very academic rigorous environment. You know, there's a lot of supports to make sure you succeed. Uh, you know, I don't think the Brown School, the Brown School I think does a good job of trying to make sure everyone does succeed that comes through, but it is still going to be uh, a rigorous process to be able to get a lot of these great opportunities and to be prepared to be uh, a partner in these social change aspects. It, it takes a lot of rigorous academic work to do that. Um, irrespective of the methodological approach that the, the professor or the staff or lecturer may provide for you for that class. So, um, you know, a lot of times students struggle with just getting comfortable with the rhythm of, of reading. Uh, and so I would say it was in regards to that, you know, there's a lot of, you know, I think everyone's very supportive. Your professors will often give you feedback, but there's also library resources. There's also student services. Is also the Teaching Institute. There's this, you know, and some of these things are in the Brown School, but they're also university wide. There's different writing support services, um, just a lot of things to help you get into the pace. And also, you know, I do know we have, you know, dedicated staff within the Brown School who can also help you think about maybe, maybe take this course with this course <laughs> and not add this course until next semester, you know, just to give you some feedback on how to balance between what the expectations will be between classes. One thing I've seen about faculty at the Brown School, they're, they're very available, I think, for students and individual meetings. And I, I've seen that um, from a number of people and just uh, being there for students when they need them different periods of time. And I think, um, that has been something that's been very beneficial. I know for a number of the students that I've uh, been involved with, and not necessarily me specifically that they've reached out to, but for other faculty that I've seen um, students reach out to, 
for support in different areas and and I and I think that's really a, a great thing that we have going here. I'm going to jump in really quick to say thank you um, to my fellow panelists and to everyone who tuned in today. I hate to leave. I know that there are more, more great questions, but I teach at one o'clock, so I have to go get to my room and get set up. But thank you so much. It was a pleasure to uh, be in this space with you all. Thank you so much, Molly. All right. Yeah, so moving right along, we do have a, a lot of really wonderful questions, and I have a feeling we won't be able to get to all of them, but thank you guys for submitting so many good ones. We'll keep trucking along. And then if we have questions at the end that are still remaining, we'll let you know how to get in touch with us. Um, but next question I will pose to this panel. Um, wondering how you think the roles and relationships between clinicians and researchers um, kind of work on these different levels of practice? Is it a collaboration? Or do you think it's more important for social worker to have both practice and research experience? What, what are your perspectives on that? Yes. <laughs> yes, have both. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I, I think uh, being able to do both is a really good thing. But I really think that collaborating with others and having some form of a relationship with some of your peers and coworkers is extremely valuable. Um, we can all build off of each other in a number of different ways. And I, I find that those relationships are very beneficial. Um, whether they were in my prior, prior to being here at the Brown School as an, an instructor uh, at other institutions and being able to collaborate with other individuals um, an act of practice was also very beneficial, um, whether it be in a research clinician relationship or a clinician clinician and just being able to share and support each other. It's, it's really phenomenal being able to grow from your peers. Yeah, and I would just add, you know, seconding what's been, been shared, you know, how much research experience you decide to pursue as a MSW student is going to depend on what your goals are, but even just making sure that you're leaving with a strong foundation of understanding the research process and, and the way research works. Because again, as we talk about policy, you know, research is also connected in many cases on how decisions are made uh, across levels of practice. So feeling strong and being able to evaluate research is important. I'll just chime in with one quick thought and that is you know we often talk about evidence-based practice but it's also incredibly important to think about practice-based evidence and I think as a researcher if you're disconnected from the issues that are really occurring like on the ground you might have the most sophisticated statistical tools or analytic tools in the world and you might just be asking irrelevant questions if you're disconnected from you know what how these the various issues that we're talking about really play out so i think it's incredibly important for researchers to to stay grounded and and connected to a wide variety of people absolutely well we're nearing the end of the session and so i do want to um, pose one final question to the three of you and i say again thank you so much for being here and offering such wonderful perspectives and insights um, I imagine that folks listening are, I, I hope, as excited as I am about this. This has been such a refreshing and, and really engaging conversation. And now we're, you know, hopefully very excited about the possibility of coming to the Brown School. And so um, with that, you know, what piece of advice might you have for someone who is considering join, joining us in the fall or sometime in the future? Uh, and I'll start with Manasa. Can you repeat the question again, please? <laughs> yes, of course. Any advice that you have for prospective students? Um, I would say uh, a big thing is making sure that you have a, a good amount of time available to you. Like I know we've said before that um, the program here specifically is a little bit more intensive than maybe some other programs. And just making sure you have a good amount of time to be able to uh, devote to this. I mean, it's a really one thing when I think about this field is that 
it's very valuable to me. Um, and if we don't kind of respect it and respect our education, then we're really not going to get everything that we should get out of it. And I think time is one of those areas we really need to devote to um, our education and, and just be engaged in that process. Uh, otherwise, it really, um, a lot of things will miss if we, if we don't do that. I guess my advice would be to um, just ask for what you need. It doesn't hurt to ask whether that is a formal accommodation through the Disability Resources Center or an informal accommodation in a classroom. Um, you know, it just doesn't hurt to ask whether it's something around, um, you know, working with admissions to explore housing opportunities in, in our region, if you're going to be moving here, or just thinking about, you know, maybe you want to be connected to a student or an alum, it does not hurt to ask. So um, that's, that's my advice. Yeah, and I, I think I would just echo what's been shared, um, you know, on one level, I would say there's so many opportunities, so many great things to get involved with, you know, try to remember and stay true to your purpose uh, coming to this program. What, why did you come to the Brown School? What were you hoping to advance? And, you know, you know, staying focused will help you make decisions and navigate and also keep your why as, you know, things come up, whether it's like administrative based things that can be annoying, or maybe you don't feel like a certain assignment is completely connected, but keeping your why is very important. But I will also say be open to learning more than what what you came to do. Um, and just, you know, being able to have that. And I think also, the third thing related to that is just don't be shy from asking for help, you know, don't struggle in the dark. You know, there's, there's a there was a, um, a phrase that was always told to me when I was younger, like two people can't benefit from education, those who are too arrogant and those who are too shy. Because if you're too arrogant or too haughty, you'll think you know it all, right? And you won't be open to what others can give you. But if you're too shy, you won't be able to ask for help. You know, <laughs> you won't be able to get those supports you need to advance. So I would just say, you know, stay true to your purpose uh, and, and definitely just, you know, take the opportunity uh, to get support and also to grow the knowledge um, that you you may not have at that at your current stage. Great, really great sound advice from all three of you. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to share my screen one final time uh, with just a few next steps for folks. So. If you want to learn more, you really enjoyed this conversation and want to continue it, um, we'd be happy to connect you with faculty, whether that's someone here um, or another one of our faculty members at the Brown School. Uh, you're also very welcome to talk to our current students about their experiences, um, and you can do that by scheduling a virtual or an in-person visit. Uh, we also have many virtual info sessions coming up in the coming weeks and months. And those will be soon will be posted to our website. So stay tuned for those, but feel free to reach out if you have questions. Um, and finally, here is my contact information as well as just the general Office of Admissions and Recruitment email address. If you have any questions after today, feel free to reach out to myself or anyone in my team. Uh, for those who submitted an application by our early action deadline, December 1, you may be anxiously awaiting your admission decision. Uh, and so know that those will be getting to you by uh, February 1st, so one week from today. Uh, so you'll be start getting admission decisions and we'll be really excited to start chatting with you about next steps then too. Uh, but in the meantime, I hope everyone has a wonderful day. If you're in St. Louis, stay warm uh, and Hope to stay in touch with you very soon. Thank you all.